Okay, good evening and welcome everybody to this York Open Lecture. Um, it seems appropriate that we're going to be talking this evening about conspiracy theories. We're on the eve of the US midterm elections and among the candidates are a large number who have consistently denied um, Joe Biden's electoral victory in 2020. Um, there have been numerous uh, conspiracy theories swirling ar around those elections, the 2020 elections associated with QAnon. And of course, Donald Trump himself uh, rose to political prominence by promoting the conspiracy theory that uh, Barack Obama was in fact born in Kenya and not eligible to be president of the United States and that there had been an immense cover up of that fact. Um, but conspiracy theories have a much longer history than that. And a seminal moment in the modern history of conspiracy theory is the JFK assassination. So it's very appropriate that we're talking about that this evening. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, who's Adam Coper. Now, Adam is a PhD student. He's uh, in the Department of Politics at the University of York. He's been here for a, a number of years now, three years now. Um, and he's the recipient of a prestigious White Rose um, doctoral fellowship, and has been doing a range of uh, a range of studies and a thesis that's concentrating on the concept of conspiracy theories. So um, I won't take up any more more of your time. I'll hand over now to Adam to introduce his talk on the JFK assassination. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Alfred. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, just a second. So uh, thanks very much to Alfred and um, for the, 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 the nice introduction there. And thanks also to uh, the Uni of York Events Office team for helping to organize, doing most of the organization for this talk. Um, and I should also thank the White Rose College of the Arts and Humanities for supporting me throughout my uh, PhD. And so today I want to talk about uh, one of the case studies from my PhD thesis. Uh, I don't focus only on the Kennedy assassination in that, but um, it's one of my three case studies. And I'm going to approach it today from the perspective of political theory. So what I'm interested in here is what these conspiracy theories about the assassination have to say about politics, about power, and about society. And I'm interested in any political values or assumptions they express, whether implicitly or explicitly. And as the Kennedy assassination conspiracy theories are a uh, one of my case studies, I was quite surprised when a friend told me about this uh, strange development with QAnon that came about about a year ago and has sort of developed a bit since, which is this strange incorporation of the Kennedy's legacy um, into the QAnon conspiratorial worldview. So about a year ago, there was this idea emerged amongst QAnon supporters that, um, that JFK Jr., so uh, the president's son, was going to be uh, Donald Trump's running mate in the 2024 presidential election. And this is despite the fact that JFK Jr. died in 1991. But according to this particular claim, he is actually just in hiding, that he never died, that he um, faked his own death, and that he's going to emerge ahead of 2024 and um, join Donald Trump as his vice president. And then later on, just at the start of this year, another similar sort of belief came out, which was um, uh, a belief that JFK himself, the, the president this time, not his son, had appeared at a Donald Trump rally and had somehow appeared as Donald Trump. I'm not really sure how that worked in a sort of physical sense, but supposedly the person on stage was not actually Donald Trump, but was uh, the uh, well President Kennedy, even though he died way back in 1963. And this struck me as strange because um, it just seems strange that the legacy of Kennedy and the Kennedy family more broadly had been incorporated into a, a right wing populist uh, sort of political framework and political worldview 
because of how Kennedy himself is always remembered or usually remembered as this sort of progressive, optimistic, liberal president who um, sort of started the path towards greater civil rights, who managed to navigate tensions with the Soviet Union. And, um, and yet it's strange to then see him all these decades later being incorporated into a worldview that's very much about the good and innocent people versus the evil elites. And I was wondering, uh, well, in this talk, I'm going to try and sort of offer a partial answer to this, but I'm going to um, do it in a slightly different way. So I'm going to be talking about the presentation of these um, conspiracy theories on film. Um, so I'm not thinking here about the depiction of conspiracy theorists in a kind of negative light. I'm thinking more in terms of films that positively support the conspiracy theory version of events. And I'm going to be thinking, I'm going to be talking about three different films. The first of which is Rush to Judgment from 1967. The second one is Executive Action from 1973. And the third one is Oliver Stone's epic J, uh, JFK from 1991. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not able to show clips from these movies because of copyright reasons, but um, I will be including some stills and hopefully my descriptions of the films will do them justice. But um, they're all available on the internet. Um, some of them to buy Rush Judgments up on YouTube as a, um, if you want to find it. Um, so yeah, but, um, and what I'm interested in here is how has the sort of articulation and the presentation of the conspiracy theory changed over time and kind of looking at it through these three different um, films. And the argument, oh, that went right to the back. Sorry, <laughs> I'm giving you a hint of what comes next. So the argument, I want to make is that firstly that the political content of these films, um, well sorry, the political content of these conspiracy theories changes over time from a, a more progressive and liberal perspective to a more populist and conservative one. So with Rush to Judgment you've got what I would see as a relatively sort of um, moderate perspective, a moderate kind of liberal perspective and then by the time we get to Oliver Stone's JFK you've got something that seems far more conservative. And the second aspect of my argument is that these films and the sort of their particular presentation of the conspiracy theories prefigure the rise of populism in American politics. They um, point to sort of trends around distrust of politicians that have just that's just grown in the last few decades and contributed to this uh, populist narrative of the people versus the elites. Now, before we get on with talking about the actual conspiracy theories themselves and about the films. I'd like to just go with some basic background information on John F. Kennedy and um, the assassination. So Kennedy was elected in 1960. He beat the vice president, Richard Nixon. Uh, it was a very narrow uh, vote. So, I mean, in, in terms of the popular vote, at least it was, I think there was a, about a hundred thousand votes between the two of them. And I think one of the reasons why Kennedy uh, edged it in that election was his use of his sort of pioneering use of visual media in his campaigning. So um, one of the interesting things is that the first televised presidential debate occurred during the 1960 election, whereas in previous versions, uh, previous iterations, it had been um, broadcast on the radio. And it was interesting to note that um, this was ha happening at a time in which television was increasingly accessible to Americans, more and more of them own televisions in their own home. So for the first time they were seeing these debates and seeing the candidates um, in their own home, in a sense, in the setting of their own home. And he succeeded quite um, well in these, um, in the televised debates. So he was photogenic and he spoke directly to the camera, which might not seem that remarkable today, but at the time it was relatively novel. Um, and especially in comparison to Nixon, Nixon was supposedly looking off to the sides to check the clock every five seconds. And this kind of gave the idea, um, according to one um, author I read, it made him look kind of shifty. And uh, as Ned O'Gorman has described, Kennedy's image that he projected through these television appearances and uh, photographic opportunities was that of a, a man who was, quote, youthful, energetic, bold, articulate, and equally comfortable in the world of politics and celebrity. But there is a kind of discrepancy here where on the surface we have this image of Kennedy as young and energetic and a family man, um, but in private he suffered from Addison's disease uh, which was um, apparently one of the reasons why he seemed quite tanned a lot of the time. 
and he also had chronic back pain that made him not as athletic as the media sometimes depicted him as. And uh, moreover, um, his relationship with his wife and his children was a bit strained. Um, he'd had multiple uh, affairs and the, all of this kind of contrasted with his public image. Um, but that image was sort of key to his politics that he projected this image of optimism, of a new age of progressive optimism, and his politics matched that image. He spoke of peace and development and uh, for the whole world. And during his presidency, Kennedy, he achieved things like signing a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union. And he also um, raised the minimum wage. He started to push for great, uh, a broadening of uh, civil rights for black Americans, although he didn't um, uh, go the whole way during his presidency. Um, that was something that Lyndon B. Johnson would carry on with. And uh, there's this interesting quote that I've found from Thurston Clark, who has written a, an interesting book on Kennedy's final 100 days in office before the assassination. And he says, uh, Clark says that, quote, a majority of Americans said his assassination had been a unique event in their lives, more traumatic than Pearl Harbor or President Franklin D. Roosevelt's sudden death. 79% reported mourning him like someone very close and dear. And I think that really speaks to the sort of importance of Kennedy's image um, and the effect that the assassination had on the population, that um, they had a, the, the public had a much more intimate and familiar um, relationship with him through his image. And so the depiction or the sort of imagery that came out of his assassination was especially traumatic. Now, just to give some background on the assassination itself. So in 1963, Kennedy was looking ahead to the 1964 presidential election, he'd be facing Barry Goldwater, who was um, from the right wing of the Republican Party, quite radical by their standards at the time. And as a result, many people were thinking that Kennedy would have a pretty easy go at the election. Um, and he was visiting, he decided to visit Texas um, to meet with other Democrats in Texas in order to have a sort of show of um, unity amongst, uh, amongst the Democrats, despite tensions over things like um, segregation, race relations. And so he visited Dallas, where he uh, was going to ride in a motorcade with uh, uh, Texas Governor uh, John Connolly, who was sat in front of him in the car. And um, as they came into Dealey Plaza, which is this big open space in Dallas, uh, that's lined on three sides, I think, with buildings and on one side with uh, some sort of overpass, uh, the motorcade was fired at. Uh, three shots were fired, two of them struck the motorcade and another one missed. So Kennedy was hit once from behind in the neck and once in the head. Kennedy, uh, sorry, Texas Governor John Connolly was also struck because he was sat immediately in front of him. And um, as the official uh, narrative says, all of these shots were fired by um, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was positioned on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building. And um, this quickly led to criticism from some, some conspiracy oh no, well, critics at the time. I don't want to jump ahead and start calling them conspiracy theorists, but um, people were pointing out that, um, that the shots had been too rapid to be fired by one person because um, the type of rifle being used was quite old and they reckoned that it would be nearly impossible to fire so many shots so quickly and that as a result there must have been a second shooter and hence a conspiracy. Um, they believed that Kennedy's head wound um, would have come from a shot from the front rather than the, the rear so most places most a, a lot of conspiracy theorists place that shots coming from uh, the uh, area depicted in this picture uh, picture so behind that kind of wall in the background is supposedly where the the other shooter was positioned on this infamous grassy knoll. And um, they also draw attention to the fact that uh, Jack Ruby, um, I don't think I've mentioned yet, but Jack Ruby uh, was a Dallas nightclub owner who two days after Oswald's arrest shot him on camera. Like they were, the press were there, he jumped out, he shot Oswald and uh, killed him. And many conspiracy theorists have uh, speculated that Ruby had connections to uh, not only the Dallas police, but also to the criminal underworld in uh, Dallas and that his murder of Oswald was part of an effort to 
silence him and to, um, well, yeah, definitively silence him and stop the truth of the assassination and the conspiracy um, coming out. And it's also worth noting, I think, that um, a lot of these conspiracy theories make heavy use of the photographs and films that were taken that day by ordinary people. And this is an interesting point, is that, um, that most of the prime, uh, the main photographs and films we have of the event itself were taken by amateurs. People just happened to be there who wanted to get a picture of their president as he rode by, who inadvertently captured this terrible moment. And um, for many conspiracy theorists, this is kind of brilliant evidence because it's beyond the reach of, um, of the government themselves and um, that it sort of provides a sort of a good, um, as Josiah Thompson, another, I think a conspiracy theorist who's written a lot on this topic has said that it's kind of, it's a evidentiary base, it, it sort of authenticates itself. So who were these early critics, these people who were um, questioning the official account of the uh, assassination. So, as Catherine Olmsted describes, many of them were um, just private citizens who weren't professional investigators or weren't professional journalists who were just working in their own time. Um, they didn't have these connections to powerful uh, people in government um, or in the media. They formed this kind of loose grasswork, net a grassroot network of researchers and uh, many of them, interestingly enough, were um, women. So many of the leading members being women, they were people like uh, Sylvia Meager, for example. She produced the first subject index for the official report into the assassination, which you can see on the right, um, simply because the original report lacked a subject index. And um, that sort of very laborious but necessary work was done by uh, Sylvia Meager. And more than as well as that, they were, Catherine Olmsted describes in her book and her article on this sort of topic, which I really recommend. She describes how uh, a lot of the people involved in this original criticism and this early researching into what might have gone on instead of the official account were had themselves been targeted during the McCarthy era, and so they kind of were familiar with the notion that their government could victimize them, and they believed that as ordinary citizens they possessed the sort of ability to. Um, find out the truth that had been hidden to, by the, uh, hidden from them by their government. And so I think that in a sense, they were practicing what the political theorist Pierre Rosanvalon has called counter-democracy, which is this idea that citizens uh, work to protect democracy by being vigilant and watchful of the state and its activities um, by trying to boost transparency, hold their elect, uh, officials to account. And by counter-democracy, he doesn't mean that it's anti-democratic, he just means that it's kind of the other side to voting and uh, representative politics. And I think that it's also interesting that a lot of these early critics were skeptical or cynical, felt cynical towards the media and the mass media and their role in this whole thing. They felt that they were involved in some way in a cover-up. So Mark Klein, who I'll move on to in a, in a second, um, an early conspiracy theorist writing on this topic, he um, refers to the quote, princes of the network, and he thinks that they enjoy a closer than arm's length relationship with the government. And then Jim Garrison, who I'll get to later in this um, talk when we talk about JFK, the movie, um, he has this interesting quote from an interview where he says that the mass media is creating a concentration camp of the mind. Um, but despite this kind of skepticism and cynicism about the media, uh, these critics themselves had to engage with mass media in order to disseminate their opinions. If they wanted people to um, be persuaded by their beliefs and their claims and their arguments, they had to find some way of spreading that information and spreading their opinions. And um, one interesting example is, um, I, well, the Garrison quote that I just gave that was given in an interview with Playboy magazine. So at the same time as criticizing mass media, he himself is engaging with media. And then another example is this um, film here, Rush to Judgment from 1967, which is a film by this um, conspiracy theorist. I, I don't know, I don't want to be too pejorative with that term in this case, but um, Mark Lane, uh, he's a, a, well, he was a lawyer. He was also a civil rights activist and interestingly enough, a Democrat, a member of New York's state legislature. Um, and he'd been arrested as part of the freedom rides in the South. So had a very sort of, um, very much his, his background was very much in progressive politics. And the film was based on his book, also called Rush to Judgment. And um, it makes the case, uh, sorry, it sort of 
attacks the government's case, if that makes sense. It, it offers a very negative and lengthy critique of the official investigation and the report into the assassination. Um, but at this stage, it doesn't really engage in much sort of uh, overt speculation about who did it and how they did it. Instead, it's doing things like trying to suggest points such as that Jack Ruby had ties to the Dallas police. Uh, it's also using eyewitness testimony to suggest that there were more than three shots. Um, it's also using eyewitness testimony just to indicate that um, a second shooter had been seen somewhere else on Dealey Plaza. There's uh, talk of um, he interviews people who see, say that they've seen like a puff of smoke emerging from behind um, a fence. And they reckon that could have been the position of the, uh, the second shooter. Uh, it's a very dry film, to be honest. Uh, it draws on very much the same body of um, evidence as the official report. So here are just a few stills from the, um, the film. As you can see, it's uh, relatively low budget. Um, it's rather simple in how it's presented, just interviews of people, people who knew uh, Oswald and Ruby, um, but it also draws on some of the same evidence that's used in the Warren Commission's report. So, for example, in the center at the top, you've got the, um, the sort of autopsy chart that shows where Kennedy was shot, um, and that's taken from the Warren report. And then beneath, you can even still see the uh, commission exhibit label on this uh, photograph of the uh, bullet that was fired at the motorcade. And it plays a lot on Lane's credentials as a lawyer. It tries to sort of make him out to be a, a, an authority on this case. And um, it's almost presented, as this quote here suggests, as a brief for the defense. So the, one of Lane's motivations for making the book and for making this film is that because Oswald died before he got a tr uh, he, the, the case went to trial, that he was not um, given fair treatment, he wasn't given a defense. And so he wants to kind of offer that defense himself. And as part of that defense, he argues that the government basically had its own idea of what happened and it just set out to prove that one theory um, that it didn't consider alternative accounts of the event. It's just concerned with proving its own theory. And so, as he says, of the single bullet theory, necessity dictated that the theory become a conclusion. So just to recap where we've got to at this stage, um, we have a very reformed sort of form of um, conspiracy theory. Uh, it's one that's very careful not to speculate about who killed Kennedy or what their motivation was. And is an attempt to see measured, ration, uh, very rational, very moderate, I suppose, drawing on the sort of like our sort of feeling, you know, attitudes towards people in high positions like lawyers to sort of give backing to what uh, Lane is saying. Um, and what's more, most of the figures involved with as we've seen so far are liberals, progressives, and uh, they've generally formed this kind of loose network uh, working together, uh, corresponding with each other to sort of build up their understanding of what occurred. Now, I'm gonna jump ahead a bit to 1973 to another film with which, in which uh, Mark Klain was involved. This film is called Executive Action. Uh, it stars Burt Lancaster, Will Gear from the Waltons TV show and um, Robert Ryan, who'd previously been in I Married a Communist. Um, I think that's a piece of McCarthyite propaganda. Um, and then he's also been in The Naked Spur. And um, so Mark Lane isn't quite referred to as a, he's not described as a screenwriter in this, but he, the story is attributed to him. And whereas in the previous film, Lane was presenting this very sort of measured critique, uh, just trying to take down the official account of what happened. Here we get more speculation um, and we have this sort of dramatization of what he thinks happened, or at least what him and Donald Freed, the other person who contributed to the story, thought had happened. And I think that the fact that Hollywood stars start to be brought in at this point um, is interesting because, well, um, it sort of shows that the, 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 the conspiracy theory is becoming in a way commercialized and it's becoming a product um, that needs famous faces to help sell it and it points to the sort of need to have an exciting product that you can promote to people. Um, and I, I, I think this is reminiscent of something that I, I read from Frederick Jameson, uh, another kind of um, cultural critic and theorist. Um, and he argues that conspiracy narr narratives have this sort of, um, they do this work of taking abstract networks of power and trying to make them visible. And I think that this film tries to do something similar. So Burt Lancaster plays the supposed, the kind of the anti-hero of the film. He goes about 
recruiting the assassins. He goes about um, explaining why the president needs to be killed. And he uh, explains exactly how it's going to happen. Um, and I think that this is a case of a sort of um, making what had been hidden in Rush to Judgment visible in a sense that, 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 that um, Burt Lancaster and uh, all these other famous faces are being used to make what had been previously been a suggested implicit conspiracy that it was in the shadow, something hidden into something visible that's personal, that we've got faces we can attach to it, even if they're just fictional and speculative for now, it is still this sort of thing of that we have something we can actually look at. And, um, and also it plays up the sort of dramatic and uh, dramatic element. And it's interesting to note that the um, film is quite open about how it blends fiction and fact. So here at the very start of the film, it has this little interesting disclaimer that um, raises the possibility that this is this might be one way that it happened, but who knows how it really happened. And I think this is a recurring line you see in conspiracy theories to this current day is this notion that um, a lot of conspiracy theorists uh, will express a sort of sentiment that they're not saying what's definitively true. They're just raising questions. They're just raising doubts about the official story. And this is just one possible way that it happened. Um, and there's a lot of other sort of blending of fact and fiction in the film. So early on, we have this sort of meeting in a country retreat where all the current conspirators come together and talk to each other about why they want JFK to be assassinated and how they're going to do it. And there's an interesting reference here to the contents of the Warren Commission, something that if, if you, I only picked up on because I leafed through it a few days before watching this film, um, which is that at one point in this, so you kind of see it in the top right um, image here, that Burt Lancaster is presenting his sort of case to the other conspirators, and he makes this point that, that basically he says, I have a quote here, in Europe, heads of state always die at the hands of conspirators. Our presidents are killed by madmen. And it's interesting because that is actually a line of argument that appears in the Warren Commission's report, in the official report into the investigation, uh, sorry, into the assassination. And it's interesting that whereas in the Warren report, that line is used as historical evidence against the possibility of a conspiracy or the probability of a conspiracy. In this film, it's used as cover for the conspiracy and it's sort of in this interesting way things that would otherwise that would usually disprove or at least suggest that a conspiracy isn't likely are now being incorporated in order to kind of strengthen the conspiracy and um moreover the film itself like it plays up to this image that kennedy had sort of crafted during his lifetime so kennedy is portrayed as a very principled man and the conspirators believe that he's about to lead uh, lead the Black Revolution, as they put it, and pull out of Vietnam. Um, and so a lot of liberal hopes are uh, pinned to this sort of figure of Kennedy. He doesn't really figure much in the film, but he's talked about as this kind of, the, you know, this almost like liberal utopia is about to happen if we don't stop him now. Um, and the film also combines elements of actual footage of the assassination with um, dramatization. So this is an actual... Um, frame that was taken from a recording of the assassination and then it's put alongside this dramatization with an actor um, to sort of show us how it could have happened and how they kind of almost in a literal way piecing it together and using um, the sort of fictional element to as, as to, to, in a way as a sort of missing jigsaw piece that they're slotting in. Now what we have here I think that um, that's interesting is that there's, we sort of start to see the commercialization of this conspiracy theory in a way. So it's been sort of adapted to fit the, the format of a feature film and to fit the needs of uh, the audience that goes to see such a film. So the careful argumentation is gone. And instead we have drama, we have action, we have intrigue. Um, the famous faces are brought in to stand for um, the faceless conspirators that were su merely suggested in Rush to Judgment. Um, and in that sense, sort of like the, the conspirators become individuals or they become sort of concretized in a sense, whereas before they were just these shadowy figures. And this takes us on to the final film I want to talk about, which is JFK, Oliver Stone's epic film. And I think that this film really continues that kind of line of um, the commercial aspect of the film affecting the way the conspiracy theory is presented. So... The film is based on Jim Garrison's investigations into the assassination. 
and the alleged involvement of uh, businessman Clay Shaw in Kennedy's death. Uh, Garrison prosecuted Shaw, um, who became the only person, I think, who's ever been brought to trial for Kennedy's murder, but Shaw was ultimately just found innocent by the, by the jury. Um, so like, as that suggests, like Lane, Shaw, um, Garrison, sorry, has a background in law. Um, he was district attorney for New Orleans. And um, as mentioned earlier in that earlier quote that I had right at the start, he believed, he, he believed that the media was in some way involved in a cover up here. Um, and going back to that interview with Playboy magazine, uh, he notes that, or at least according to him, um, Kennedy was killed because he was working for peace and he was killed by quote, hard eyed men with guns who believe that anybody who doesn't think as they do should be incarcerated or exterminated. So there's this interesting notion in that I think that there's an extreme element within politics that is kind of infringing upon and undermining normal politics and that Garrison is out to sort of stop those extremists. And I find that interesting because that is also a line that has been used in the critique of conspiracy theorists themselves. So a lot of critics of conspiracy theorists will say that um, that the conspiracy, or they will treat the conspiracy theory as a kind of extreme other that is outside the norm that we need to marginalize and stop infringing upon democracy. Um, getting back to the film, uh, the fact that in reality, Garrison failed to send Shaw to jail for the murder of Kennedy, uh, that doesn't get in the way of the film itself. Instead, they kind of make up for it by focusing a lot more on Garrison's kind of personal development as a character, um, and um, it's interesting that they choose to focus on him, on him because he seems like a, a, the ideal figure to focus on because he ha comes across as much more, I mean, this is going from the interview and from in, um, documentary footage I've seen of Garrison that he does come across as a lot more charismatic than Mark Lane. Um, and he has lines like in the um, Playboy interview, he has this line that sounds like it's already been written by a screenwriter. That it sounds like it's come straight from a film noir, which is, he says, I'm going to break this case and let the public know the truth. I won't quit before that day. I wouldn't give the bastards the satisfaction. And so there's this weird sense in which Garrison is almost already this kind of character um, and that JFK is just kind of building on that. Um, and it, the film itself builds, uh, like, adds to this notion that Garrison uh, was a sort of lone crusader, a, a hero fighting on his own for the truth. Um, and the lead role is played well, Garrison is played by Kevin Costner, as you can see here, um, and he's joined by an ensemble cast of people such as Donald Sutherland, Kevin Bacon, Gary Oldman, many, many more. Um, it is an actually an interesting, and it's, it's quite a good film, I would say, although I, you know, I, I don't subscribe to the conspiracy theory version of events, but it is a very entertaining film. Um, and I find it interesting the way it focuses on Garrison in his personal life, because as Garrison goes deeper down the rabbit hole and becomes more and more involved in the um, in the investigation, his relationship, we see his sort of personal relationship with his wife and his children starting to strain. So in one particularly memorable scene, um, his wife, which is, I've got it on the top left here, Garrison's wife confronts him and um, basically accuses him of being too absent from the family's life and too engrossed in the um, investigation and she asks him what kind of a man are you and she goes on to say that she thinks that Garrison cares more about John Kennedy than your own family and so there's this interesting aspect here where um, Garrison's own ma uh, masculinity is being called into question and that is interesting because it matches with the depiction of the culprits in the film um, so Clay Shaw and this other character of David Ferry are both depicted as, as gay and they're shown as sort of engaging. They, they, they hire a male sex worker at one point, they take drugs, um, they have a party and they get dressed up. And for some reason, this is used as kind of like to insinuate that they're the real culprits. They've really done this. And um, it's not exactly, well, I guess it does it explain partly why, but there is a sort of interesting aspect here that, um, of, of sort of the idea that traditional norms around gender and around the family and around sexuality are under attack in addition to democracy itself. Um, and it should also be noted at this stage that Kevin Costner's character as Garrison um, is actually a composite char character. So even though he's based on an actual person, um, Zachary Sklar, yeah, I've got the quote here, he um, 
mentions about how when they were writing the actual screenplay that was based on Garrison's book, that they had to throw in a lot more information that Garrison would not have known at the time of the investigation that other um, researchers and conspiracy theorists would have uncovered. And so um, I think this really shows how, because of the need to have a coherent narrative and an appealing character, um, you end up with this story where we've moved from the loose network of researchers working together and now we've got this story of one man's quest for the truth. And not only is it a quest for a truth, but it's a, quest, it's a quest to sort of reaffirm his own position as a man and as a father. Um, it's also worth noting that Garrison himself appears in a brief um, part of the film in a cameo role as none other than Chief Justice Earl Warren himself. And I think this again speaks to the way that the conspiracy theory sort of becomes incorporated into the, the medium in a way that, um, that he's gone from calling the mass media the concentration camp of the mind to being actively partaking in it and having a fun little role in it. Um, it's also worth talking about the, um, the populist aspect of this film. So I think this is something that wasn't so evident in the, either of the previous two films, um, is this sort of idea that the assassination is not just an attack on democracy, but it's part of a broader story of uh, the good American people versus the bad elites. So there's one scene, a very lengthy scene towards the end of the film, where Garrison is delivering his speech to the courtroom. And um, rather than just focusing on the details of the assassination, he starts to reflect on the broader significance of the assassination for the American people. He becomes tearful at one point, and he talks about how he's received all this money from um, all these people from different walks of life who are just sending him donations to help him with his investigation. And he tells us that, that these people, these are people who quote, want their country back because it still belongs to us, as long as the people have the guts to fight for what they believe in. And he goes on in a really strange way to compare Kennedy to Hamlet's murdered father. Um, and he refers to Americans as the, the children of a slain father leader whose killers still possess the throne. And I think so we have this still have this kind of counter democratic aspect going on here about bringing um, what is hidden into the light and making politics, bringing politics back to the people, back to the demos in a way. Um, but now it's taking this more explicitly populist turn where the people are being characterized as uh, innately good and innocent, and in this sense, like weirdly childlike, um, as though they've lost this sort of figure of order that this, this, the, the Kennedy brought in order to American society that has now been lost. And um, that there is now a sort of vacant position that needs to be filled by a paternalistic leader. And this brings me on to back to the question I sort of started with about how has JFK and JFK Jr. sort of been mixed together with QAnon? Um, and I think we start to see, I hope that it starts to become a bit more, make a bit more sense here, that there has been this gradual shift within um, conspiracy theories about Kennedy to a more kind of populist um, presentation, a more conservative one, where uh, the Phil, uh, so the, um, it becomes more about a populist narrative rather than about specifically just proving the facts of the assassination. So it's more about sort of the attack is not just on democracy itself, but it's on um, against the good people and it's against uh, traditional notions of what a man is and what what sexuality should be and how the family should be structured. Um, and that there's sort of this feeling of a greater sense of um, social anxiety around um, social categories, if that makes sense. And these fears and these sort of this this distrust of the elite um, has been picked upon picked up by um, Donald Trump in recent years. And also, I think Donald Trump, as with many populist leaders, has sort of tried to play this role of the paternalistic father figure of promising to make America great again, very much in the same way that Kevin Costner's character wants the people to take the country back. Um, Donald Trump has also spoken about how, you know, that there's the old line about bringing back uh, manufacturing jobs, um, making things the way they used to be, basically, um, when social categories are around um, everything from politics to so, um, culture and gender and all these issues were sort of far more clear and social boundaries were a lot more rigid, but you had a, easier to, to grasp, perhaps. Um, 
And in this context with Donald Trump presenting himself as some sort of like figure who can restore order, I think it makes a lot more sense now why um, someone like, or the legacy of JFK could be combined with Donald Trump's own politics. Um, yeah, and that brings me to the end. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Adam. So um, I'm gonna go to, so you're all welcome to post questions in the Q&A bar. Um, we do have one question up already, so I'll, I'll start off with that one. It's from Ian Ferguson, and it's very simple. Adam, uh, what are your other two conspiracy theories? Oh, my other two sort of case studies, I guess, um, is what's being asked about there. Um, my other two, the first one is um, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. So I'll be looking at, um, I have been looking at the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, and I've also been looking a lot at um, Henry Ford, the industrialist, he wrote quite a, few, quite a lot of anti-Semitic material. And I've, so I've been looking at that and comparing those two, as well as some later anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And then the other, the other case study I've got is um, COVID-19 anti-vax conspiracy theory. Uh, and there, so I've been focusing on one single um, writer, a, um, uh, what's the term, a kind of... Um, uh, a wellness guru who sort of crossed into the realm of conspiracy theory and I find that very interesting that kind of um, the way that those two areas can overlap sometimes with people kind of cross from spirituality and wellness into a, a kind of conspiratorial view of the world. Oh, excellent um well if I could ask a, if I could ask a quick question um so you tell the story of from these three films of going from a more progressive liberal to a more, as you say, conservative populist. Um, do you think conspiracy theories are, are today more conservative or, or, or not? Um, that's a really good question. I think that on the whole, the major ones are, that doesn't stop you from getting left-wing conspiracy theories or you know, progressive conspiracy theories. So, I mean, with anti-Semitism, for example, you do get, um, there's quite a strong strain of, uh, of left-wing anti-Semitism, unfortunately, that has the same sort of conspiratorial worldview. Um, but I think that the ones that at least have influence at the moment seem to be more um, conservative. I don't know if it's because of a sort of era we're going through a sort of fear of change um, and that people are sort of worried about the, the social categories or social, um, the way we interact kind of has been changing a lot. The issues around LGBTQ rights have been progressing very quickly and that maybe this has resulted in some sort of pushback. That's not to say that that pushback is at all justified, but um, I think that might be why some people latch onto them. And I think also um, during the age of the internet, there's sort of uh, a lot of people out there who are offering um explanations to people as you know sort of like almost like i don't want to say easy explanations but they've got a particular framework they want to push um and it just seems to often be a conservative one um although i i don't want to sort of speculate too much about why that is so i, I don't want to make it sound like all conspiracy theories are conservative you do get left-wing ones but yeah. the big ones at the moment seem to be on the right so I have a question um, from Stephen Edwards, who says, empirical question, are we getting quantifiably more conspiracy theories these days? Oh, that's an interesting one. So I guess it means, uh, I, I assume that what's being asked there is like, in terms of the proportion, the proportion of people believing in conspiracy theories, is that going up? Um, the evidence that I've seen is that conspiracy theory belief was already quite widespread um that it's not really as marginal as we often assume it to be um but that michael butter i think michael butter is a really interesting person to read up on on this where he has this argument that um conspiracy theories are more marginal now than ever but in a way they become more visible because of that marginality that prior to their kind of stigmatization that people would have just accepted a conspiracy theory as one of many different types of explanation available to people. 
but that since it's become sort of marginalized, that we become more aware of it. And um, so I think that in a sense, um, it's more prevalent than it is, but I don't think that it's like, maybe in the last few months, what with um, with, with Trump and with the 2020 uh, election and all that, I think that maybe it's, there's a, a spike happening again. I'm not sure. Um, but I think that the marginality of conspiracy theory is like a, a relatively recent thing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's great. We've got a question from Anne saying, we're familiar with the mixing of reality with drama these days. Were audiences in the past able to distinguish reality from dramatization? And I suppose more broadly, it's a question I was wondering about as well. Like you show narrative as a really important sort of vehicle for like conspiracy theory, that they, that they tell stories. So can you say something about that storytelling aspect of conspiracy theory and, and perhaps how that changes over time? Right, no, I think that's a really a really good question, actually. Um, so, I mean, even by the time of the, 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 the assassination happening itself, of course you have, you know, real events being dramatized for film. I think by then people were relatively familiar with the idea that, um, you know, biopics were kind of a thing by then. Um, films about historical events um, were prevalent at that time. Um, but I think that what's interesting about the case of this particular um, conspiracy theory is the way that you're aware that you're watching something that is fictional, but you're not aware to what degree it's fictional. And you're not aware of where that line is between what is concrete fact and what is just speculation. Or for example, with the case of um, Garrison's character and JFK, the fact that it's a composite character is not at all uh, obvious to the average viewer. If you go in, you you can assume that you know parts of it are going to be made up or embellished, but um, it's not a clear, at all clear. Um, it's not even that clear to me, like where the line is between the real garrison and the fake garrison, and the, oh, not the fake, the fictional garrison. Just in the sense that, um, like, the, I'm I, even me, somebody who's like read up on this quite a bit by now. I, I couldn't tell you what aspects of the film are clearly something that Garrison himself has uncovered or something that another conspiracy theorist has uncovered. Um, so it's sort of this interesting kind of blending of fact and fiction that I think just kind of can confuse things, but at the same time as confusing things as to in terms of what is fact and fiction, that it becomes quite an efficient way of, of pushing the narrative. That if the narrative has this sort of like some some very rudimentary basis in fact um that it becomes quite a sort of appealing one if you think like oh no there could be something to this rather than it just being wholly fictionalized so i think that kind of combining of fact and fiction could help to actually kind of push the narrative and make it more popular yeah well i mean just just following up on that briefly because it's striking that the sort of you know the the story you tell has these three movies and it ends in 1991, right? Just mm. before the rise of the internet. Yeah. And they're classic examples of, you know, um, narratives constructed for a particular audience in a pretty one-way mass transmission, right? And then there's the rise of this two-way medium in which people yeah. interact and produce stories in a different way. So a huge question, but how has the internet changed the, the, God, the, I think so the theory in your view? I think the internet in a certain way has facilitated a particular type of conspiracy theorizing, one that is a lot more speculative. So there's a book by um, Nancy Rosenblum and Russell Moorhead about this uh, that's called, I think it's called A Lot of People Are Saying, or it might be called The New Conspiracists, but um, uh, maybe you can correct me if I've got that wrong, but um, that it's an interesting book in which they make the argument that a new type of conspiracy theory has emerged and they refer to it as new conspiracism um but sometimes they refer to it as conspiracy without the theory and i really like that um i think the historical aspect of that argument is a bit iffy that i'm not sure if it is really as new as they make it out to be but this idea of conspiracy without the theory i think that that has really been encouraged by the internet and by um, through platforms such as Twitter, I think, where there's a sort of ability to get rumors going without needing to provide as much evidence as you would have done in the past. So, you know, you think back to conspiracy theory magazines of the late 20th century, where, you know, people would have to have photographs to sort of demonstrate the truth of their 
claims or you know they have to explain their argument in full whereas nowadays on twitter you can just go on and say you know i've heard that so and so was involved in such and such plot and get the ball rolling like that um and i think of course it's also enabled a sort of um those conspiracy theories to reach a broader audience just because of the way the internet's had such a you know a wide reach it means that these conspiracy theories can go around the world and come back to you in a completely different form if that makes sense Ooh. so uh, we've got a question here from morris waddle uh, saying are you aware of any so-called conspiracy theories from the 20th 21st centuries that became accepted views of reality so in a way yeah so in a way i think getting at that um the idea that we know that there are conspiracies right. um what's the difference between a theory of a conspiracy you know is <laughs> I Were get... there conspiracy theories that did become right. accepted? So let me think, because there, 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 there are some interesting examples, things like the Watergate um, controversy, which are often listed as sort of examples of conspiracies that turned out to be true. Um, but the question I ask myself about that is, um, was the sort of speculation around the Watergate um, break-in, was that ever a conspiracy theory? I'm not sure if people saw it like that at the time. Um, but that's definitely one example of where uh, a conspiracy claim, at least, became uh, proven true later on. Um, I think another one that I wouldn't say is sort of strictly true in a, in a sort of literal sense, but, um, but there's this, uh, for example, like among, um, uh, there's a sort of a, a sort of a type of conspiracy theory that comes from the African American community, where there's a sort of profound distrust of the government and of medical authority specifically. Um, so you have claims such as that um, HIV/AIDS was uh, concocted in order to commit genocide against Black Americans. Um, and whilst I don't think that that is, you know, a correct claim, um, there is this sort of interesting backstory there where. Um, of um, black people in America being experimented upon, being mistreated um, by medical authorities that can at least go some way to partly explaining why those sort of claims gain traction amongst people. So there are cases such as the Tuskegee um, uh, experiments where a group of uh, African-American men who had syphilis were told they were being treated for a condition that was referred to as black bad blood, although the, the people involved never explained what it meant. And for years and years, they just tracked the development of these people's syphilis until they died, just to see what the effects of it were on the human body. And when they were saying that they were treating them, they were actually just um, taking samples to measure the progress of the syphilis. And so cases like that kind of make you think like, well, maybe there is something to it. But at the same time, I think that's more, you know, that goes further to explaining why there is that kind of broader attitude. So yeah um okay we've we've got a ton of questions and then um, we're not going to get through them all but um i suppose there's one if i can just assimilate a couple of the questions one of them is is about whether there are any conspiracy theories that you believe and the questioner asked this is partly a serious question um and another of the questions says how, how has your work gone down in conspiracy theory circles um, which if we could put it another way, have you had much interaction with people you might describe as conspiracy theorists? Oh, um, so just to answer the, the second question first, I have not had any interaction with them directly. Um, I've encountered people in day-to-day -day life who've expressed conspiracy theories to me and, um, or, you know, if I tell them my research is on conspiracy theory, then they, you know, um, sort of offer me their two cents about some conspiracy they believe in. Um, I don't know what the reception, I hope that, they, <laughs> I'm part of, like, kind of worried now that I'm gonna go on some forum and find that somebody's like, you know, um, pasted a link to this event um, and that I'm gonna get hunted down, hopefully not. Um, anyway, but on terms of the other question about are there any conspiracies that I believe in? So <laughs> a very minor one, I don't know if it's minor, but, I'm kind of partly 
I'm open to, this is a very specific one, but I'm partly open to the suggestion that there was match rigging in the 2002 FIFA World Cup, um, because in one match in particular, the referee just seems to go haywire and start, you know, making bizarre decisions and um, penalising, I think it was Italy versus South Korea. And there was a lot of talk about this being... Um, uh, this being FIFA kind of like setting up the match because South Korea were hosting the tournament and they wanted the hosts to go far. That's what a lighter one I believe in. Um, and then I've been kind of slightly, the, the JFK research that, or the stuff that I've read on the JFK assassination has sort of made me think a bit deeper, but it's, I haven't found one that I've found entirely convincing so far. So yeah, so I only have really like one relatively minor <laughs> one that I believe in. Excellent. Well, that's, um, I think that's a nice note to finish on. We've just come, we're just approaching now the very end of our time. Uh, apologies to everybody who put questions on the Q&A. We did have a lot of questions uh, and we couldn't get to everybody. Um, but it was wonderful to have that kind of engagement. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, thank you to the organisers for putting this together. And I think also a big thank you to Adam for giving, uh, giving a great talk. So, um, Thanks very much, Adam. Oh, thanks, Alfred. And um, yeah, thanks to everyone who helped organize this and thanks to uh, the White Rose. Um, so yeah, thanks. Excellent. All right. Well,